This is DJ745 for worldofreggae.com, sitting aside a man who has done so much for the music industry and for the people in his community. Gives me great pleasure to welcome Black Adred to the viewers of worldofreggae.com. Blessed love Rastafari, I give thanks to life, you know. A pleasure to be here. Well, Black Adred, what can we say other than thank you very much for sharing such a personal insight into your life in the documentary Being Blacker? Yeah, because sometimes in life you have to you have to put yourself out, you know. And I'm a, I've always been a community-based person. I love my community. And people people is what make the world go around, contrary to what others say. So without people you are nothing because, you know, it'd be a very lonely life, you know. So it's always been like, for me, dealing with people. And it was a pleasure to be able to put across so many different issues in, in the space of 90 minutes and, and it's kind of been magnificent, the, the response so far. I mean, when I saw some of the trailers for the documentary, I was thinking, OK, here we go. This is going to be one of those once a year things that, you know, the national television does where they do like a little insight into reggae. But it was so much more than that. And I mean, from the opening scenes, you could see that this is, documentary is a lot more than just about music, right? Yeah, because um, originally it was it was meant to be music, but there there was also a, a more bigger picture to concentrate on. Which in having that opportunity to do that for me was was greater than you know the Black and Dread music man. Who knows knows you know within the industry I'm already a part of the industry. You can't get me out. You know I'm I'm a solid. You know I'm a cornerstone of the reggae industry, especially from the UK angle. So to me there was a bigger picture. There was always things that were in the background of my life that I felt that this was the opportunity to put it across. You know. Mm. Where did the inspiration come from to actually record this? documentary it was almost like a 24 hours with black dread because you know there were so many scenes you know inside your house it, it seemed like a lot of it was shot almost like ad-libbed it wasn't planned at all yeah nothing nothing there's nothing there's nothing that we had a double take on or anything like that it was just me being me and and putting across the views that now that i've the reaction of the people is actually a lot of other people's views but you know it's not everyone that gets the opportunity to be able to put across those views. So for me, just the reaction of the people shows me that we went in the right direction. And, and it was just inspired by life, the issues of life, the things I've gone through, seeing friends go through. Um, when I had my shop, it was like a hub. People used to come there and the amount of times I've had to talk to people on subjects I know nothing about and having to, you know, people come crying, people come laughing, people come with their problems financially, just family problems. It, it was just like a, a one-stop, come and ask black out. <laughs> <laughs> Corner, you know? Yeah. So I just developed that, that knowledge, learning from people within because I know a lot of professional people that I'm always speaking to and I get a lot of advice from them and sometimes you just happen to help out someone you say something and it changes their life and that's priceless you can't buy that in the corner shop can you or in or in one of the major shops yeah I mean I, I first met you probably over 20 years ago when I used to come to the shop to buy records, mainly on a Thursday. And that's the spirit that I always got, that it was almost like, you know, a centerpiece of the community. One, you know, I remember like standing at the counter and then people like Marcia Griffiths would just pass by and hail you up. And it just had that real community vibe to it. And those memories always stuck in my mind. Um, whilst I was there to buy music, you could just sort of pick up on so many other things whilst just hanging in the shop as well. Yeah, yeah, it was it was like that, you know. It was it was the place, the go-to place. Um, if you was an artist coming from Jamaica, even from America, I had loads of American artists. I've even had the Prime Minister of Jamaica in there. I've had the, the Minister for Tourism, Minister for Sports. I've had um, like Ken Livingstone, who was the Mayor of London. I had lots of people passing through that shop because it became so iconic. It was in Lambeth's 
um, program as places to visit when you come to Brixton. Yeah, so yeah, it was it was brilliant. You know, what I mean, from an humble beginning, and it could have done so much for a community. It's almost. You know, you can pinch me and I don't think you, I would feel it because sometimes I, I, I still wonder how we managed to do all that in that little shop. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, within the documentary itself, you know, you touched on so many subjects that are so, you know, sort of pertinent in today's times. You know, I mean, things like, you know, sort of like youth crime, race. I mean, at the moment, you know, it's been in the news that, you know, London is taking over other cities in the world as being like the murder capital and things we've had I think what over 50 um, murders this year so far how do you feel about all these things that are taking place literally on our doorstep yeah my thoughts are very deep with this because uh, I lost my son in 2004 so it's this is not nothing that surprising me and do you know what maybe lots of this was happening before but it wasn't getting the media attention because you know it's about news, isn't it? And, and it's what's current. So that's something to talk about at the moment, you know what I mean? You've got like a commissioner of police who was once the head of Trident, who was feared by every black youth in, in London. So what kind, you know what I mean? People are not seeing the bigger picture. They're talking about curfews. They're, they're not seeing, this is all playing into the new world order, what they want. The next thing you're gonna get your microchip so we know where you are. So a lot of people are not really seeing the bigger picture. They're just jumping on this bandwagon because the television is the greatest manipulator of the mind you can get. And because it's manipulated people's mind, they, some people tend to believe everything they see on the TV. So what's going to happen now is that the more you talk about it, is the more it's going to happen. Because it's, it's, it's a reaction thing, isn't it? Because England is not, it's pro, it's not a proactive country. You just check the whole country. It's not proactive. It's always reactive, so they react to situations. This is something that's been building up for the last 10, 15 years, and they've done nothing about it because they've always swept it under the carpet. They've always felt that it's gonna go away, it's gonna go away. But it's like when people talk about Jamaica and they try to show the bad side, I always say to people, but we don't make guns. We don't make guns in Jamaica. England won the way they get the guns from. You make guns. You make guns. You make guns. So guns are going to be here. You can't be that stupid to be asked how the guns get here. Of course, it's got to get here some way. And they're made here. Um, they're in, exported from here. They go away and they come back. Come on, people know. It's, it's not dumb. It's, it's, it's not really rocket science. But the peoples and the powers that be... They try to keep things away from the normal, from the public, you know, and, and the public get confused. They don't even know which way to turn. Very, very true. So really what you're saying is that the fundamental problem lies at a much a higher or deeper level, something that maybe you or I are never going to be able to address. Yeah, because we can never get to that position. And then one, one of my pet hates is seeing people that are not really connected and when these situations happen, you get a lot of people that's disconnected and they're disenfranchised from the actual community and they're speaking for the community. It's one of my pet hates, people speaking for the community that know nothing about the community and speaking about issues. They've never been there. You know what I mean? If you've never lost a son or a daughter, you'll never, you, you'll think about it and you'll feel it for them, but you never ever know until you've been there. And, it, and it's not a great pleasure to be talking like this because I still miss my son 14 years. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about the people who've lost theirs last week or yesterday or the day before and what they're gonna go through and 14 years later I'm still grieving so I know I feel what they're gonna go through and I and I've got empathy with all of them but it's coming from a far a place it's coming from this is they've taken away everything there's no community centers and one of the things I was trying to say um, I was speaking to like Ed Miliband the other day at one of the screenings of the show and I was saying everywhere every five minutes there's a Tesco or a Sainsbury's or a Morrison's or a co-op, yeah? When, they, when, the, when the councils give them permission to build all these wonderful and horrible looking buildings that they're building nowadays, yeah? Why don't they put it in their contract that they have to build a community centre as well? All these massive shops, they're the size of community centres. We don't even need that big space for a community centre. So you could have dropped them, yes, at least 
there was one uh, back in the day. I always used to remember when I used to talk to the police back in the day, and I, I remember asking a policeman one day, "So why do you let all these shabins go on? Why do you let all that happen?" And they said, "Well, at least we know where you are." And that was so. It was so clever that to me that was just it. They knew where we were, so they didn't have to go driving around the streets to find us because they know we was in that should be down the road we was in that club down the road so they've taken all that away so now they don't know where we are and now they're frightened so it's not like i'm saying it's not brilliance that's showing you these things it's life experience and those things are so easy to, to just check and, and and see you know where we are you don't need to find us <laughs> you understand you don't know where we are you're gonna have to run around like a headless chicken to find us so give us places that you know where we are <laughs> True. <laughs> i don't know <laughs> yeah. what sort of time period was that whole documentary recorded over well originally the first time when molly came to see me she was just actually excited by the olympic games in 2012 okay and I think she just thought, you know what, let me just go and check Blackout. And she just came over. She wanted to see what kind of vibe was going on in Brixton. And that's when she first came over and she, the day when Usain Bolt was doing the 100 meters. And she came down and there was a few people, quite a few people at the shop just watching, the, watching it and just trying to build a vibe because we couldn't get into the Olympic Stadium no matter how we tried. Um, so we just, we were at the shop and people just kept coming and stopping and she came there and, and saw a crowd, she filmed us and then we just began talking. Then we lost track again for about another year or so. And then when my mum passed, I, I rang her up and said, Molly, um, my mum's passed away. Um, could you come and do do this for me? Because I'd done my son's one, but when I look back at the quality, the quality wasn't that great and this was my mum, this was the woman that, you know what I mean, this is my heartbeat, that's me, that's my mum, I'm my mum, I, I, I am my mum and I just wanted to have something that was so good because the, the actual funeral is three and a half hours worth of footage that Molly's got. Um, so there's only clips that was seen in there, but the actual DVD that she done for us is so brilliant. That could be a documentary by itself and um, that for me, I couldn't have done no better. I've got a top, top person who's also a friend who didn't charge no money and gave me the best quality that I could get. You know what I mean? You couldn't, you can't ask for better. Really cool. Yeah, great, you yeah. know? And the Molly that you're talking about, you have history going back, back into the early 80s because I think you first met her during the Sound Business documentaries. Yeah, in 81, 82, you know, and we done that Sound Business and I mean, she done it as a student documentary. And I was speaking to one of her professors and, and um, her teacher wanted to chuck all that away. Really? And, and, and the professor told me, he said, I watched it and I thought it was magnificent. So he told the, the teacher, just let her do what she's doing. And it's become one of the most iconic sound system documentaries out of build speaker boxes, string up sound, just for people to see. We're actually trying to um, re-record it, like get better quality in our it because it was done like she says on the cheapest format you could get yeah. as a student yeah. back then but it's all over the internet but we're trying to clean it up i've seen a cleaner version which looks a lot better but i think she said it can be done better as well mm. yeah and i mean back then in the early 80s that's when you were moving with a sound called coxon yeah. And, you know, that's probably the sound system where a lot of people that are probably watching this today know the name Blacker Dread from. So give us a little bit of an insight into how did you, as a youth, get involved with Coxon? Well, I, I, I used to be with a sound called Ayatel King, just up the road from where we are now. We're in Brixton now and um, I lived in Tulsa Hill and a friend of mine, Derek, and, and a few of his mates, they built a sound called Ayatel King because there was other sounds like Whoppy King, D. Roscoe, um, Count Tom, um, little small sounds in the area. So they built a sound. We had about seven speaker boxes. We used to play all around Annerley, all around the area and stuff like that. And um, but they were all fans of Sir Coxon. They were mad Coxon fans. They were not like just having a little sound. Was having a little sound, but you always also had your sound. 
So Coxon used to come and play where we lived in the house dances around where we lived. He used to play in Shepherd's Youth Club on Railton Road in Brixton, which was known as the front line. And um with and down there was another place on the front line called Cons. Coxon used to play there every Monday and Tuesday. Then you had the big um church in the middle of Brixton there, St. Matthew's it used to be the Crip and Coxon used to play there on a Wednesday. And then Coxon used to play down in Stockwell, so Coxon was the sound. The sound. <laughs> they played every day. As long as you wanted to go to a dance, you could go to a Coxon dance, man. That was, oh my gosh, that was magnificent. Um, just what, what sort of year was this? Was this in like the late This 70s? is like, um, I was going there from like 72, 73, wow. 74, 75, then 76, I ended up joining Coxon. I was going Coxon when I was a little kid. I used to go to Brockwell Park when Coxon played there on a Sunday. They used to play all night, and then after playing out all night, these guys would go and play football matches against other sound, sound systems. systems. That was how competitive it was. <laughs> they played all night, then they went and had football matches against other sounds. It was brilliant, and, and that was where the love and the unity came from. That's where we knew how to love each other because we all became massive friends and majority of us are still friends up to today who, who is still alive we're all still friends yeah so that was that was just magnificent brilliant and 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 a great leveler and and that's how i, I started to become a raster man from then because coxon sound was classed as a rasta sound where the teachings was love unity no war no drugs no alcohol nothing like that we were all teetotal straight born with weed and that was it, that was it. and let's give thanks to Jack Rastafari and, and that was our life we lived that life every single day we didn't eat certain things and didn't do a lot of things we didn't do and and that was that was where I, I got my upbringing from mm. so Coxon was my foundation really that's what started me in the, in what i'm doing what you're doing yeah but I, i'm thinking though that as a youth you must have been what 15 16 17 yeah. it, it kind of been easy for you to then just you know book upon coxon and say i want to be part of the sound so how did that actually work from maybe you started following coxon sound yeah. to actually operating the sound no well one day i was walking in brixton on cold arbor lane and coxon had a record shop at the front of the market at the time this was in 70, well, 70, 76, I think, yeah. And they had a record shop on Cold Arbor Lane. And me and about six of my friends, we were just walking past, going down the road, you know? And Coxon's truck was there, and they was loading on a few things on there. And I just shouted across the road, where are you going? And they said, we're going to Wolverhampton. And I just thought, can I come? And they said, yeah, because some of the, the other men that, would lift up the boxes weren't there so they said all right there's some use there so we all piled into the back of the van and yeah. we went wolverhampton and and the rest is history, history. Yeah. yeah so you started off from obviously box boy which is obviously the way that you start up in the ranks in a sound system yeah, um even start as a, as a, yeah you i mean yeah you could you could lift up the boxes that was it that was it you couldn't do anything you couldn't else records, you couldn't touch records you couldn't even touch the wires. wires you were allowed to run the wire but you couldn't string it up right. so back then we had to do the red on red and, and black on black or blue on blue whatever and then they they became a time when you could run it in circuit when people got more wiser electrically and then they cut down the homage and you could play more like you could say eight boxes on a piece of 600 valve but you could play 16 if you cut the ohms down so all these things we learned <laughs> <laughs> yeah all these things we learned um yeah and uh, after my apprenticeship of lifting up the boxes then i was allowed to run the wire and then after running the wire, I was allowed to actually touch them and string them up and tape them up. And it was like a progression, isn't it? It's like an apprenticeship. And then you, you go, go a bit forward, forward into doing that. And then just by coincidence, one night we was um, playing in Derby, a club called the Havana Club. And we, um, the, the driver, Frankie, the hawk, he parked the truck on the pavement. And the police came and said they wanted the truck moved. but. Um, I think I was the only one in there at the time and he just put a couple of records on the side and said when because there was already people in there and he said when that record finishes 
put another one on. I think it was about 15, 20 minutes. That was my whole life in that 20 minutes. I was doing <laughs> something that was unthinkable, putting on records, records. on Cox and Stone table. That was like, you know, I wish they had videos back then <laughs> or, you know what I mean? I would have loved that moment. I can't even remember what record it was right. because he just gave me some records and said to put them on. And then he took about 15, 20 minutes and he only probably gave me three records and I turned them over made them play right down to the end and then whatever and then he came in and the crowd were partying <laughs> and he said just go and play a few more and and that was my first actual and then in the same 76 the sound went to Wolverhampton and they Coxon spent seven months in Wolverhampton playing in a club called Club 67 and that's where I got my real break because we were playing there five nights a week um, and some of the nights weren't as good as some like wednesday was friday saturday sunday you know what i mean it was like roadblock the only night that was weak was i think monday night tuesday and thursday we played in bristol on a thursday every thursday we played in derby every tuesday so monday was the week night so i used to get the week night and so i started to play on the week night but i was there like from six o'clock the club didn't open until nine well, wow. I, I couldn't wait to get around the turntable. <laughs> I guess so that, you know, in those early days, it's a good way to actually learn and study the music. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. even if you're playing to a club that maybe doesn't have hundreds of people, nobody in, nobody there, in there. Just, <laughs> just me and my friends, to be quite honest. Yeah, but yeah, then they, they, they started to be like a little... A little following started to come in on one day, so probably there was like five, ten people, then it built up. And then quite a few people started to come in on one day, so... And I didn't even think anything of it. I was just so glad to be able to put the music on and touch the preamp and stuff like that. I didn't... If it was just me for the whole night, I would have been in seventh heaven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cloud nine, whatever you want to put me, I'd have been on there, mate. Now, back then in the 70s, I mean, how easy was it to get the latest music from Jamaica? Because I know that, you know, Coxon has a reputation of obviously having a lot of exclusive dub plate mixes. And when we're talking of dub plates, we're not talking of records that are basically changed up to give the name of the sound. We're talking proper dub plates, yeah, yeah, different yeah, mixes, yeah. right? Yeah, man, that, that rubbish there, that, that stuff about your sound is the best, yes. this, that. I think that helped to smash the reggae music. I, I personally think that that is one of the major, major obstacles in the, in the advancement of reggae. Because before, you didn't play records with the name of your sound in it. If you did, it was like, oh my gosh, this got Coxon's name in it. But now it's become so, even radio DJs, people who don't even have a sound, People who have cars, who have car clashes, they got enough money to pay a DJ, he'll do a tune. Back then, that was never the case. You would never get certain people singing, just singing like that. Like that. Just for, you know, but the, the business changed. So it's, but, you know, back then you got tunes and you, you'd get your tunes mixed. Especially we had Gussie Clark as, as our dub cutter and he was a up and coming wicked engineer, was engineer at Tubby's Channel One. He had his own dub cutting machine at his house and he had his own little mixer and he would get the tunes and he would when he's while cutting them he'd put extra sounds in them. So those were all exclusive, only played by Coxton. And we used to say this one only played by Coxton in the whole wide world. Because when you got a mix, it was your no mix and nobody else could play that mix. So it was a world exclusive. And, but nowadays, say, for instance, say Junior Reed or Half Pint, somebody like that, he'll sing the same song for 150, 200, 300 sounds. And everybody says they've got an exclusive because it's got your name in it. Huh? Excuse me. I would prefer to get Junior Reed to sing on the same rhythm, not call my son's sound's name, yeah? And you can't play it. That's what's an exclusive. I've done that. I've, I've even done it with Fred Locks. I got him to do all of his specials that he does for every other sound. And I got him to do it without calling Blacker or the sound name. But he's done. He's redone it on new up-to-date style. But no one else in the world can play them, only me. Right. So that's what I call a real exclusive. That's why when I produce my music, I always mix a cut for Coxon. So I've got an album called... Um, Many Moods of Blacker and the mixes are on that all the mixes that I saved because I've always done extra mixes I just grew up with the mentality that you gotta have something exclusive. exclusive so even if I'm listening at home 
I'm not listening to the one that I released. I'm listening <laughs> to the unreleased one. Because why am I listening to that one? I can listen to that any time. But the unreleased one is unreleased and that's exclusive. True. So I've still got that mentality. Even when I'm playing music at my house, I want to play. If there's a Dennis Brown and there's a released Dennis Brown and, and I've got the dub one, I'm not playing the, the released Dennis Brown. I'm playing the dub one. dub one. Because that sounds exclusive. It sounds different from what I go out seven nights a week and hear on the street. I'm, I'm just that kind of a person. I grew up on Coxon. And Coxon was an exclusive sound, exclusive dub plays, exclusive artists, exclusive rhythms. I used to make rhythms. The first session, studio session I ever done, making my own rhythms, were for the sound. It was for the 1984 um, Rasta Christmas, a live dance. We was going to do it. Sugar Mine, Don Carlos, Junior Reed, Goldilocks, Mikey Dredd, Earl 16, and the Coxon DJs. That was my first bout into actual making rhythms for myself and it was just made for the sound and i made 24 rhythms for the sound and we had artists singing on them and they weren't singing about cox and sound they were just singing tunes Jeez. but they were exclusive tunes that nobody else in the like fire there most must hear frankie paul i was playing that for like two years because i made it and no one else couldn't play it. so when i played it, i used to say as i rise i play you know what I mean? No guy can play. play. If you play this here, yeah, I mash up the sound. I used to have this hammer and I would have the hammer next to me. And I said, I said to them, if you can play this one that I'm going to put on the turntable now, yeah, I'll smash up the sound. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I was a cheeky bugger when I was playing sound. They couldn't test me. I would play songs that I know you cannot get. I had producer friends that would give me songs that nobody else. I used to be in the studio with like Exterminator Fatties and I would take exclusive mixes off of his tunes that not even he had. Songs like Greetings, Half Pint. We recorded that tune in Tootin up there. Um, you know, Greetings I Bring yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The rhythm was played by Sly and Robbie. Um, it came up from Jamaica with just the drum and the bass. Half Pint was here doing some stuff with George Pang, his producer and they wanted to voice half pint we went up to the studio half pint voice that frankie paul voice alicia and um it was andy the the engineer that played the guitar it was andy that played the guitar so the mix i had a mix as soon as half pint finished to record it i mixed it i got right. chemists to mix it right there and then so that mix went straight onto my cassette and straight onto a dub plate and up till this day that mix is the exclusive we had two mixes the one that came out on 45 was one of the cox and dub mixes that right. came out on the actual 45 but people don't know that because we pressed that tune but if you don't tell people these history they'll never know but that mm. song was made in tooting right up the road there mate wow i never knew that that was song made in tooting here yeah. literally down the road from where we're reasoning today yeah, no, yeah. most people know that but you see that's those are is those are stories that we have those are our stories that's not history history will tell you something else and they will bend the truth but we know the truth and we got proof we got the people that were there we got the engineers yes. that made it the engineer that played on it because because even though they had a studio engineer we had peter chemist because chemist was here with us and chemist w recorded it and mixed it so we always every tune when i done my nitty gritty album i had dub mixes only coxon could play sugar miner only coxon could play don carlos only coxon even though i released them the mixes that we played were exclusive, exclusive. and that's what a dub play is i don't know how the thing became so dumb that people thought that when you played and because you're saying John Tom, John Tom, John Tom, every single record. Oh my God, put me to sleep. Why do you think people don't go to those dances? dances. Why do you think people get bored? Because they're not hearing, they're turning real positive songs into a negative by putting your name in it. Mm. And I just think that's, that's crap. That's, what's, that's what is one of the downfalls in our music right now. Too many people are being egoistic and, and because they want their name in a song. Do you know what I mean? You've got people who don't even have a sound, who pay people to, to sing songs for them. What, what's the point? What, what are you going to do with it? Just to play it to your friends so you can show off. You're going to pay £100 or £200 for a song to play it in your house. All right, you got the money. Respect. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, with the dub plate things nowadays, you know, you you know, you can get dub plates through Facebook. You know, you have so much artists sort of saying, "Link me in the studio today," and things. Yeah. And you know, the actual 
sort of like the real reason or the background of dub plates we seem yeah. to have lost that yeah man there's no there's no cohesion to the thing now it's just people you got dub play artists you got artists who only sing dub play they sing a song so they can they can or make a dub plates off of it and it's never ever released and the dub plate becomes more popular than their song so how is that how do they make money out of that when the, because they're making more dub plates or your royalties over 20, 20 year period of time is still gonna out outlast your dub plate dub money. So sharing some history about dub plates here live and direct with Black Adred in Brixton. Now you mentioned a couple of names earlier on, um, George Fang George and Fang, yeah. and Fatis. Yeah, man. You seem to have a very close link with those two producers. Yeah, Tell me about working with people like George Fang for Powerhouse and yeah, Fatis. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're my bridgings. Those are my proper proper bredgins not friends not mates not pals bredgin hygiene you know that i mean when when they were here they would stay at my house i go to jamaica i stay at their house so it was much more deeper than just putting songs out george pang was already a record producer and i was just an extension of helping him to put out his records in the uk because i showed him that there was although you're getting paid in jamaica for putting out records i can put them out in england and pay you three four times the amount that you're getting in jamaica so he gave me the opportunity to do things like that and because he was my friend i would spend the money to put it out and then give him his money and they all, he always knew that he didn't have to call me for money because as soon as i made money i sent money and then fattest now came to the studio to meet me and then he became a record producer and he ended up to be like like George Pang, one of the best producers in the history of Jamaican music. So I had with Fatis now, I had I stayed at his house. I had I could any song that he put out, I could just take it and bring it to England and release it. I would he would say to me, What do you want? What do you like? Is there anything that you're hearing? So when I go down, I would just put in all the dats and I would listen. I say, I want this, I want this and that. And I bring them home and I release them. Even some of them, what I used to do was to press them in Jamaica and bring them up exclusive for my shop. So my exclusivity went as deep as when I did the record shop. Because there were some producers, manufacturers, people that didn't want to give me songs for my shop. So I thought, okay. It's two can play at that game. I got two of the best producers in Jamaica. Mm. So I was pressing records that you could only like when Sizzler. I used to press all the Sizzler songs and no other shop. If you want you go to them, they they probably want to deny it now. You go to them, ask them where they used to get their Sizzlers and Luciana songs from. You had Black to come Red. to Black or Dread shop if you wanted the latest Sizzler because I was pressing them and I would press a thousand and bring it back to England. And if you wanted it as a shopman, don't care what your name is or who you think you are, you have to come to Black or Dread to buy that or if you didn't want to come you sent somebody undercover to come and buy it but it was selling in your shop and if it's selling in your shop you got it through me i even used to leave them at fattis's house and because they didn't want to buy it from me in the uk i made them buy it in jamaica but they had to pay one pound in jamaica we weren't taking jamaican money because they were trying to bypass me to get it cheaper in jamaica and we sold it for one pound in jamaica you can't get it buy it from blacker because blacker is selling it for a pound so you don't have to pay to ship it but some <laughs> guys didn't want to do that so they prefer to ship it just to say they're getting it from jamaica mm. which was dumb because i was already shipping it through Free. you know so me and them we were so close that i had access even until today i've got songs of theirs that have never ever been released and it's just fantastic because you can have friends like that that will give you basically their belly mm. and say go and and I and I still sit down sometimes and I've got my leg up on the chair and I listen to exclusive songs in my house <laughs> produced by my mates <laughs> I've got some Gregory Isaacs that George Pang done and some Josie Wales Alton Ellis's son Noel Ellis I've got some wicked songs at home some Johnny Osborne and stuff that was produced by them and and sometimes they have to ask me and I say, to, and I make a CD for him, and I say, "Do you remember these songs?" No. Nice. I said, "These are your songs, mate." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you know, back when you had the shop, which I think started up probably in the mid '90s. That's that's around the time when, for me, Fatis, you know, in terms of production, that's when you know anything that came out on that Exterminator label, you didn't need to listen to it. Yeah. You know, it, everything was just quality, you know, Mikey General, Jesse Gender, Cocker T, yeah. Luciano Sizzler, and Keep it, everybody, everybody. Yeah, Marcia, Griffiths, Griffiths. everybody. But our fat is now, 
in terms of Fatis, Fatis' first number one was Pinchers, Lift It Up Again, which was on my rhythm. I gave him a cut of my answer rhythm and Pinchers voiced Lift It Up Again. The and that's and The Walk and Skank rhythm. Yeah. And that was Fatis' first number one. So our link was so tight. I, I, I made you into the top producer because you got a number one in Jamaica, America and the UK. What more could I do for you as, as a friend? Do you understand? And that's a kickstart. And that was on Vina label. And that was one of his girlfriends was called Vina back then. And he just his first label was Vina. And Exterminator was his friend who had a bus company called Exterminator Buses. And that's where he got the Exterminator label from. And it was me that later on took the E from the Exterminator. Because when I was pressing the records, I took the E off and just called it Exterminator. Ex right. Because Exterminator meant something else, didn't it? We exterminate, and we didn't want to exterminate anyone, so I thought let's get rid of the E and let's call it X Terminator. So we're not actually terminating anybody, that's what we used, we used to, to do. do. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he said to me, That's brilliant. I said, Okay, exterminator rather than E X T E R, just X T E R. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that, I'm that type of a person who'll come out with silly things like that, like alternational doesn't exist it's not it doesn't exist you can't have an outer national and when it, all the sounds used to say international 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 i came out and i said cox and outer national because we were playing in france and belgium and and germany and and things like that and we were playing outside london most sounds you should just play in london and say they're the best, best. yeah and you won't go nowhere you're in leicester sound plays in leicester he says he's the best birmingham sounds how many times have you been to london come on london's big mate if you're not in the capital why can you say you're the best so we used to play in birmingham like twice a week monday and saturday i was i was resident in birmingham on a monday night i was resident in wolverhampton for seven months i was resident in bristol i was resident in in derby do you know what i mean how many sounds can say they were resident 150 miles away from where they lived True. and we were resident we were there every single week we used to play in these places so that's why we said we coined the phrase cox and out national and we started to take the sound on the truck on the ferry to Paris, I, was, I remember the first time we went, I was so sick. I'd never been on a boat like that going so far and the sea was really rough. And I was so sick, I couldn't wait to land. I wanted to walk back. <laughs> <laughs> I said to them, I'm not even gonna go on the boat to come back, I'm gonna take the plane. plane. But I, 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 I toughed it out and came back. And then after the second journey back, it wasn't so bad. So then it was easier Easy. for me to like go take the train, take the train, or go under what you call it, the Channel Euro Tunnel. tunnel. Yeah. yeah. So I preferred that one because <laughs> I didn't see the war. <laughs> now here in 2018, we have a brand new album as well that you just in the process of releasing, "Many Moods of Blacker." And talk to the people about this album because I've seen some of the track listings, and there's a, there's quite a few exclusive tracks on there. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, what I did, a lot of the songs like um, the Sugar Mine, the, the Frankie Ball Fire there, Must Must Tell is an exclusive mix that I had, that was Coxon's mix. Um, the, the Don Carlos that's on there is another mix that never came out. Um, the Sugar Miner is a tune that I never put out. That's the Now That I Found You. Yeah, right, okay. Put out. That was my first song that I recorded with him in 1984. And I never ever released it. They, um, you never released that song from yeah. 1984. Yeah. Wow! <laughs> I, just, I just played them for myself and played them for my mates and on the sound. So things um, like the Dennis Brown and Frankie Paul, that's actually a special. That's what I call a special. That's something that's exclusive to just Coxon. Mm. It was Dennis Brown and Frankie Paul. No one else in the whole wide world could play that type of combination. And for us to get them in the studio, it was me and Festus that recorded that song with Dennis Brown and Frankie Paul. And I just said to Festus that I'm going to put out an album, Many Moods of Blacker. And do you know what I mean? Do you mind if I put it on the album? And he said, no, because it wasn't really our, it wasn't like, Festus production or my production it was just we just bought them in the studio yeah, yeah. and I just said to him I would like to put that on the album and it came out the Jack Raddix on there and Chant Down those songs never came out um, the Luciana did um, but I still use different mixes, mixes from the one that went out so there's quite a few artists there's um, the Beanie Man and, and Barry Salmon combination yeah. that um, I'd put out the Barry I'd put it out on a 45 but I still use a different mix Next. If you listen the lyrics are kind of moved around as well so there's right, lots of okay. little things going on tenor fly roughneck fashion was the mix that hadn't come out but because i wanted to pay tribute to jonathan sutter who passed away as my bridging that's why i put the roughneck fashion on there the walk and skank is on there because of the merit 
the the um the, the version of the Walkers Kang that I put on the album was a dub mix again. So all these things were, you know, things that I've had, and I thought, you know, it it wasn't because of the documentary. I was already in process of doing that anyway, and I tried to do it a few years ago, and I stopped. I don't know why I didn't do it, and then. I just thought, you know what, let me just do it because I don't want to be one of those people that have these things and don't put them out. And sometimes the artist will say to you, but look how long I've done that song for you. How comes you ain't put it out? So, you know, and you know, I've got an album with Jack Radix. Okay. Because I was one of the first persons in the whole wide world ever to record Jack Radix. I knew him before he was a singer. Um, I've got an half an album with Junior Reed. I've got an half an album with Josie Whale. I've got a full album with Anthony B. I've got an album with Leroy Gibbons. I've got some uh, half an album with Freddie McGregor. I've got songs with you, Roy. I just got songs that I've just been recording over the years, and I'm, I'm always been in the business. I don't ever stop recording artists. And if I've even got UK artists that I've been trying to record like Sylvia Teller, Vivian Jones mm -hmm. and you know Mikey Mystic, a lot of them Mikey Foreigner, a lot of artists Junior Chin that I'm recording, Bucky Joe and Christopher Ellis. I was gonna uh, say that's another big song yeah, right now. Yeah and Gappy Ranks I remember, do you know what I mean? And then I've got my, my, my big 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 project is the Buja Banton album that I have. Right, that okay. is, it's not titled and I've actually um, one track off of it called Innocent was on Buju's album Before the Dawn. Before the Dawn. Yeah. The last track on there I actually gave that to Buju because when he got in trouble and he was I had actually mixed that song to put out and because it was saying Janos I'm innocent and obviously his case was going on, I put that tune out and he rang me up from and he said to me, Look, I need a track. I've got nine tracks I wanna put out an album, I wanna raise some funds and I said, I just sent Take that. It. I just sent that track to him straight away. The album ended up winning the Grammy, which he never collected. So I obviously I didn't get my little piece of paper to say I got my Grammy, but I'm not really bothered about that because mm. unless Budge gets his, I don't want it. Um, it doesn't make sense. And um, so I've got my album now, which I had 14 tracks. I now have 13 because I gave Budge that one, and I've just released a track with Freddie McGregor and Budge. And Budge. Right. Um, called Stumbling Block, which is not on the album, for the mere fact that it's 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 off the Bujabantan album. Right. Okay. And I've been doing that Bujabantan album for like 14 years now. It actually started it before my son died. Okay. The same month my son died is when I started the album, and then I stopped because of the fact my son died around. You know what I mean? I'd, I'd done 10 tracks, and I, I just couldn't bring myself to do any work and then Buja said to me in around 2008, 2009 he said so what are we going to do? I said you know what DJ I could work on it so we started to work on it again and unfortunately he circumstances, circumstances beyond my control and his control at, to a certain extent happened and he went away then he got bail when he got bail um, I flew to Miami and I recorded another four tracks in his okay on a laptop in his house. I'd, I'd made the rhythms already in Jamaica with Sly and Robbie and Firehouse crew. And I took 30, like 37 rhythms to, to, to America. And, and I said, well, I've got all these rhythms here. Choose, Choose, yeah, which one you want. And I left them with him, went back to my hotel. Like 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, my hotel phone's ringing. Brrr, my mobile's ringing, Brrr, what's going on? Something must have happened in England, so I'm fighting to get the phone. Bujo, yo, where you there? Sleeping, yo, me find the tune, them and I'm ready. I mean, I said, Oh, it's four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so, by the time I get to his house now, I've woken up, got to his house. There's an old man in his 70s that lives next door that used to be an, an engineer. And Buja got him to come over, woke him up out of his bed, got him to come over to record two, the two tracks. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> and then, um. The other two tracks were recorded by Marcia Griffith's son, um, Marcus, that um, recorded them for us. So, yeah, and I ended up getting, I had, um, Freddie McGregor was there. So I said to Buju, what about a combination with Freddie? Have you ever, I've never heard a song with you and Freddie before. Uh, and he said, no, true. And I said, rang up Freddie, I said, yo, I need you to. He said, oh, you mean? And Freddie came in and they wrote the song, Buju wrote the song and they, fixed it up together and then Gramps he wrote one for him and Gramps Morgan okay. so I've got one on there with him and Gramps Morgan as well 
that's I mean I mean I listen at home like I say exclusively <laughs> <laughs> But I've mixed the album three times now. Right. I've actually been and mixed it three different times. Just to, you know, every time a couple of years passes, I think, okay, let's mix it again again. to see how it sounds. But I mean, the reason for it not being out is that with the technology and what's happening now in the world and people need visual, when you're putting out a song, if you don't got visual, you don't get as much profile on your song if you've got a good video you got a good song mm. that's that's how that's the how business it yeah. is so i just thought why would i try and put it out and not give it the respect because that's budger banton you know what i mean that's our top top artist he's not just is i think in terms of artists is he's on par with barry salmon mm. for me in the in the music industry um that's up for debate but Budger to me is the man. Um, Barry Salmon's different, and he? he's Barry Salmon, and he? he's Barry's. Yeah, <laughs> Barry is Barry. But Budger is the man that was the standard bearer for me, along with people like Sizzler. But Budger just had a different. His kind of vibes was different, you know. More on the, we when we were recording the album, we had a little joke that we had, and we I used to call him Budger Marley, because of the lyrics that he's got on the album and the way. He, he delivered them. My, I always, well, I'm Bujo Mali. That's that's all what I that's always call him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I mean, I know him as Mark Mary, but I call him Bujo Mali because of the lyrical content of the album and how he he's put it over and stuff like that. And this is before he got in trouble because I, I I had ten tracks before, before. <laughs> and the song there's there's a song called London Groove on there, um, the same stumbling block, um, What a Glory, which is a Naya Bingi song. I've got some I've some brilliant, really brilliant. I have even got a name for the album. Um, there's a song called Where There's a Will, There's a Way. And there's a little, that song, while Bujo was away, I used to, well, I, I, I've been able to talk to him a few times on the phone. He's rang me up. I couldn't ring him, but he, I was able to like put money into an account and he could ring me. And there's only one song that he actually said to me can you play that song over the phone for me? Out of the whole of the tracks, and it was a song called Where There's a Will. And it was Where There's a Will, There's a Way. And it was like, and there's another song that he's got, and he, and he, and he says, um, I've got to go and face another, just give me a moment because I've got to go and face another day. This was when he was on trial, and, and he's talking about, you know, this the only times he gets his solace is when he's listening to or recording his music. So he just wants the time to go and record some songs, and it's, it was so it's magnificent. It was, I mean, spending that week and a bit with him in Miami when he was going through that tribulation and stuff like that, it was really really art rendering and it was you know to see them trying to break him because he was on home house arrest, house arrest yeah. and he couldn't smoke he couldn't drink he couldn't do anything he just had to be there he could have a cigarette he had to have a guard in his house 24 hours a day that was the kind of um because they thought he was a flight risk mm. so that was the kind of life the man was living you know what i mean 24 hours a day you got this security man and he was having to pay for his own security Right. to have them in the house or else he would have had to go back into prison. prison. Yeah, so it was really, really art rendering for me to be over there. So for me to go and waste the album and just chuck it out there, I just thought, you know what? It's not going to do any justice. He's my bridging, so I'm going to wait for him. Mm. I'll wait for him and then I'll see what he says. If he says, well, I don't like it, I don't want it out, then so be it. I'll just keep them and listen to them at home. Listen to them on a but Sunday morning. <laughs> I listen to them every morning, but I don't think he would say that still because it, it's a good album. For yeah. me, I think I've, I'm long in the tooth enough now. I know I've been around long enough and I just think it's a really good album. Um, and I've got all the best musicians that you could think of working on it. The best engineers, best ownsmen, guitarists, everybody. Yeah, I just got the whole full nine yards because I'm well known within the industry in Jamaica. and. You know, you call someone up and say, can you do this? It's recorded at Beres's studio, Tough Gong studio, Mixing Lab studio, Mafia and Flux. We had, I had a little studio in Brixton here that we started to record the songs. The, the first 10 songs were recorded in the studio just on Summer Layton Road there. Okay. That we had, me and Rambo had a studio around there. And Joe Wipes, who used to work at Mixing Lab, was our engineer. He recorded the first 10 tracks. 
and like I said, we did the other four at Bujo's house <laughs> wow. in Miami. But the, the and then we just bounced the voice back onto the the Pro Tools, and yeah, it's, to me, it's a brilliant album, and and that's why I couldn't afford to waste it. Mm. But my other album, The Many Moods of Blacker, is is exactly what it is. Just many moods, different different productions, you know. What you have to do is to listen. Because I'm, I'm the type of person that I deal with instrumentations and I deal with, you know, you have to put the things together properly. Some people just think, I've got drum and bass and a voice and they go and mix it. No, there's lots of other little tweaks, Thanks. percussions and guitars and stuff like that to give it that, I call it industry standard. Because I look at Bob Marley's um, catalogue and I see that's the industry standard. So, so if you can, that's what you got to work. Towards. Yeah, you got yeah. to. Yeah, you work towards the standard of like the Bob Marleys, the Dennis Browns, the Gregory Isaacs, the type of quality that was coming out from those producers that were producing those songs was, you know, it, it was, just, it was a different level. Like yeah, it, yeah. It's, just, it's just brilliant. It's I don't even know how to explain <laughs> it, but it's just separate from what everything. So for me, it wasn't just about trying to. All right, I'm living in the UK, but I don't. I don't really talk about UK reggae because it's impossible to have, you can't have UK reggae. That's just the slave ma master's mentality coming in, trying to take away something. It's like Christopher Columbus, isn't it? Went to Jamaica, saw people there, and then he's come back and said, I've discovered Jamaica. How do you discover something's there? If that chair is over there, someone put the chair there. True. Do you understand? So I walk in now and I hold the chair up and I walk around the world and said, I discovered this chair in Brixton. So how did it get there in the first place? So you didn't bring the people to Jamaica. So you didn't, you're, you're, you're a liar. You didn't, you didn't discover anything. It was just, it's just for historical facts. This is what I said, his story and our story are different stories. So the history doesn't necessarily mean it's the truth. Mm. It's just being, it's just what's been written down. But the real story is when you go to the real people and you ask those indigenous people and they say, well, my great, 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 great grandfather was here when Christopher Columbus came. So what, he discovered me as well? Do you understand? So it's, it's the same thing with reggae. People in the UK are always trying to say UK reggae or lovers rock. John Oat was singing that type of music long before anybody started to make them kind of music. When Louisa Marx's tune, Caught You in a Lie, was made, it wasn't made as a lover's rock, rock tune. It was made as a reggae tune. When Sugar Miner made Good Thing Going, it wasn't made, it was made in the UK, recorded and made in the UK. He didn't make it as a lover's rock song. It was just a coin. There was a record label called Lover's Rock and everybody jumped on the name Lover's Rock and then it became a genre of reggae for some reason it's like um dance hall dance hall is a place you go to dance just check it dance hall is a place you go. you dance hall cannot be a, a music impossible it's a place where people go if you rent the town hall and you put a sound system or a disco in there that's a dance hall people used to go and do the waltz and whatever in a dance hall so dance hall is not even a genre to me it's just a name that people have adapted and tried to make it into something that it isn't but for me reggae is reggae whether it's djing whether it's dub no, whether it's roots. whatever roots it's all one music and from the powers that be are able to change that and then manipulate it and call it what they want because they want to section it off because they want this piece for themselves these people want that you know what i mean so i'm going to take it over here dance all is and then we got all these other people and then they're talking all kind of crap and they're saying x-rated stuff and derogatory stuff and so we're going to push it over there but that's what the big companies are promoting mm. that's what they were promoting they're not promoting promoting because they didn't have another bob marley so they're not promoting roots and culture they're not promoting the music that's sending a message to people they're promoting the music that's saying crap to people and then now the kids are doing crap people are trying to say well 
it's the music no it's you the powers that be that put that music in that in that corner for the people in that corner to listen to because the the, the majority of the people are not listening to it they're not going around killing each other they're just living their lives and enjoying music as as it should have was made to, made be. to be so i i just oh my gosh it's something that I, I, I i'm so passionate about it and i think i'm the only one years ago i went to green sleeves and Jetstar, and I said, why, why are you trying to say, what's Raga? For me, a Raga Muffin is a man that walks around like what they call a tramp. That's what a Raga Muffin is in Jamaica. A Raga is a man that walks around, because you're Raga Raga, because your clothes is torn so up and loose whatever, up. and loose up, and you don't look good. That's Raga. So you're telling me, you're, you've changed my music into Raga music now. Come on, you lot. It's just because people don't know, and you don't have the medium to to fight against it, to like show people what they're really trying to do. And 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 they did it, they did it. They changed up the whole thing. Remember, we used to get at least one or two number ones in the British charts every year, reggae music. But they then tried to come with the Sean Pauls and people like that. Yes, it's nice, and I still dance to them, and I will go out and I will still listen to it, but it's reggae music. Don't try and tell me it's now whatever drum and bass drum and bass is what we were playing in the 70s <laughs> we were playing that stuff coxon used to play every song that you played the vocals then you played the instrumental which was the dub and tubbies was mixing this drum so how comes all of a sudden drum and bass has become another genre of reggae mm. so just what i'm saying it's about manipulation and it's so easy to manipulate people just give it a name put it out there in the media enough times and you you know what i mean they can change your name from john to tony if they want to it can be done it's as simple as that do you know what i mean you can change a car the name of a car to something else because you don't you know what i mean like there used to be bmw used to be bad man wagon or black man wagon you know what i mean we never it's so it's, it's nothing to do with that but it's, it's what i mean you can manipulate whatever you want to be whatever you want at the time yeah well blacker i have to give an immense thanks to you for sharing so many insights into a part of your life because I feel like we've not even touched on some of the services and you know I give thanks to you for spending time with the listeners and viewers of World Reggae a closing message to the people that have been following you yeah all I can say is give thanks for life and the support has been tremendous I, I'm overwhelmed by the response especially from the program being black it's been so overwhelming what people have been saying and the issues that is that's that is risen up and and brought it into the public domain i've got ministers people like that i've even had a commissioner of police that little youth ties that was on at the end mm -hmm. she said she wants to meet people like that i saw her on tv saying that so my job now is to get ties to bryce i mean to go in and be with those people to tell them this is what the youths are doing so you know I'm, I'm just giving thanks for life and giving every day i give thanks for another day and the support of the people is being tremendous so it's 150 billion percent worth of love that's that's my message and and try if you use them try and find out what your youths are doing try to have that family bondage don't let them be in their rooms by themselves just have some love time just have some love time in the house have some time where you can't go on your phone now. No, you can't. These two hours is family. Even on a Sunday, just get back that, that table out in the middle of the, the front room or in the kitchen and have your Sunday meals together. Have some conversations. Do you know what I mean? Dads, just try and interact with your son. Just try. You know what I mean? When you looked in the program, you see mama's son play. We still play. We play, I'm, I'm a little kid by her and I love playing and I will play with my sons all the time. My daughters, I play with them, we go out together, stuff like that. So just try and, and bring that love back because that's the only winner, you know, because at the moment what's going on and the amount of people that are dying and dying and dying is only love can conquer, nothing else. All these curfews and all that rubbish, protesting and march, we've been protesting, we've been rioting, we've been talking, we've been doing all of that, but people have forgot that the only thing was love because it was love that made them in the first place. True. <laughs> so why don't we just go back to where we were and see if that can help. Can help. You know what I mean? And if people start promoting that, do you know what I mean? When the hippies was around, you didn't have all this violence. All they preached was love, innit? <laughs> but Rastas has been doing it all the time. 
It's like going into a restaurant now and seeing vegetarian food. This is what I've been eating for the last 50 years. Come on, you're not going to be able to sell me something that I know about. So let's let's go back to the beginning then, yeah? Love. Back to the roots. Yeah, love, unity, you know? Peace, love, unity, the trinity, you know? Mm. Father, son and mother, you know? Because you can't leave the mother out of anything because the woman, you are going to be the backbone. You're the only ones that can change it because the man them is always out there chatting, doing their thing. So for me, it's just love. Nothing but love, 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 love to the whole world. Peace, love and unity. Blessed love, Rastafari, I give thanks. More life, more peace, more prosperity, more unity. Everything boils down to love.